Since the 1970s, the film industry has been contending with The Chin. Now, Gareth Miles and Simon Appleton examine each year in the career of Bruce Campbell. Hello and welcome to A Year in the Career, the podcast that looks at the career of Bruce Campbell one year at a time. In this episode, we're looking at 1987, a particularly notable year in Bruce's career, um, and uh, one I'm excited about getting into. Um, I'm your host, Gareth. Uh, You can find me at GarethMiles.com and on Twitter at GarethMiles. You can email me at Gareth at a year in the career dot com, and my cheerful co-host is Simon Appleton. Yeah, you can also contact me at Simon at a year in the career dot com. You can also find my cheerful chirpy movie blog moviemustache dot com, uh, where you might find a helpful streaming guide on how to survive the lockdown. Uh, you can also mm-hmm. contact me at movie underscore mustache on Twitter. Okay, and I take up one of your tips on how to survive the lockdown is to watch the entire career of Bruce Campbell. That's obviously one of them, but I've started writing uh, reviews as a streaming guide, things that you can stream and my opinions on them. Uh, I think uh, volume or part one, as I called it, I streamed in a day the entire first series of Star Trek Picard on Amazon Prime. Oh, wow. Did you make it past episode four without falling asleep? Uh, the funny thing is you've got to get past episode four to get into the into the good stuff. I, I was I binged it all in a day, so it, it, it certainly I, I'm glad I waited for all the episodes to become available. I know we've been destroyed as a race by the ability to stream and binge an entire season of a TV show in one in one day rather than waiting a week between episodes. Yeah. As a fan of 24, I remember sitting there and between weeks and every episode only represents an hour in a day so actually not a lot happens in each individual episode and having to wait a week i could do it and now i looked at picard coming out i thought i'm gonna wait for that all to be available and i streamed it in a day i'm noticing that actually most of the tv shows that i'm watching are still on a weekly basis yeah they're starting Um, to do that again is even with shows that are primarily on streaming they're releasing uh one episode a week rather than allowing you to binge the entire lot. I don't know which I'd prefer. Like I said, we've been ruined. <laughs> totally, yes. But it's nice to have the option. I suppose it works for one set of people one way and another set of people the other. Indeed. Well, uh, last time on the show, uh, we discussed um, two fairly disappointing entries into Bruce's career, uh, the 1985 monster, <laughs> Crime Wave, and then the 1985 remake, Thou Shalt Not Kill Except, which doesn't actually feature Bruce, but he has a little bit of a credit there that's uh, that's worth noting. Uh, this week we're going to be looking at one of my favourite films ever made, one of the reasons why I am doing this <laughs> podcast, um, and that is Evil Dead 2. Now, in our first podcast, or in 1981 episode of the podcast, we talk about how... The Evil Dead and the legacy of it are, are pretty great and pretty terrific and things like that. But it was Evil Dead 2 that really cemented it for me as a terrific movie. And the balance of the the chaos that happens in The Evil Dead and even in Crime Wave as well uh, gets almost moderated. They I think they've learned so much from those two previous films that Evil Dead 2 just has the perfect level of comedy chaos slow down moments to let the audience breathe and and then back into the action you know it 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 develops everything so well and i guess all i could do is gush about it however simon is the one who has not seen this prior to recording the podcast so i'm going to put it to simon evil dead 2 where did you go with it well so far in this experience of doing this podcast it's the best time I've had. I really, really enjoyed it. I loved the Brilliant. the combination of horror and comedy. I, I know because of the rights issues, they had to tweak certain elements to the, the start of the story. But I like what they did there. I like that the car is still there. Yeah, this film was just great. It, it really was. Um, after the last, as last week's episode, you probably learned that I was not overly impressed with Crime Wave. And then to watch this... Oh, I was blown away. The production value is fantastic. The, the story is still good. 
But right in the middle there, Bruce is still Ash. Now, he does a bit of development as you get towards the end of the film, but as we start, Ash is still a regular guy. He still just travelled up to the woods with his girlfriend, and all of a sudden, all holy shit breaks loose. And we are just along for the ride. We're just yeah. we're literally dragged along behind him, and everything about it. The they dialed it up. Everything, the action, the story, every, and yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought they did very well with it. Excellent, excellent. It's it's interesting what you say about the the opening of Evil Dead Two. Um, it's it's only in recent memory that uh, we we finally got an explanation for. The, the, the crossover from Evil Dead to Evil Dead 2, those opening 15 minutes where they, they, as you say, couldn't get the rights to be able to retell the story, so they had to reshoot some of it to get him back into the action. For many years, uh, there were rumours flying about that because of the way Ash's character develops between Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness, he's not the brightest tool in the box. <laughs> And there was speculation that he could just be dumb enough that he decides to bring another girlfriend up to the cabin. And th this was something that I found a little bit too ridiculous. The idea that Ash uh, goes back up to the cabin is uh, c completely unbelievable. Uh, you know, if, if you've watched any other film that, that does something along these last time on The Evil Dead or, <laughs> or a television show, you know that those opening 15 minutes are just, this is what happened in the previous film. Yeah. And especially the fact that in Army of Darkness, they go back and do that again, but even with with more of a previously on the Evil Dead um, a pro, a pro, a prologue, isn't it? Uh, yes. Or, you know, that, that makes total sense that this is the winning 15 minutes is just what happened in the last film uh, for any new audience because this got a wider release. Uh, they couldn't count that everyone had seen the Evil Dead because at the time it was very difficult to track it down. Um so getting Evil Dead 2 out, um, it was going to be uh, finding a whole fresh new audience. So they had to give people what they needed to be able to understand what was happening. Now, Evil Dead 2 is a film that very much defies the odds in that whilst it's a, a horror sequel in a world where we were getting a lot of horror sequels, we were getting the Return of the Living Dead, uh, Freddy was on the scene, uh, Jason was out doing his thing. Halloween was out doing their thing. Um, but Evil Dead 2 had to do something slightly different. And it seems such an odd idea in, the, in that environment to inject the amount of comedy that they did into the film. And, and that, you know, you can understand where it comes from knowing Bruce and Sam and Robert Tabert's uh, particular style. Uh, over the last number of films, but for a new audience member walking into Evil Dead 2 and seeing this on the screen and seeing the, the laugh-out-loud comedy that they've thrown in there, but not making this a parody of the horror films that are out there, it's, it's a really odd thing for them to do. What, what do you think about that? Would you have been able to to comprehend the comedy had you not seen the likes of Crime Wave and and then where they go with that? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think... Um... Again, in a lot of ways, it reminded me of Shaun of the Dead, which is truly horrifying. It is a zombie apocalypse, but they find the comedy in it of real-life people. I mean, look, look at all the, the memes and jokes that have been going around the internet recently. Uh, the end is near because the pub that played the Winchester in Shaun of the Dead is closed. You know, you uh -huh. can't go to the Winchester and let things all blow over. And again, I saw it in this... And like you say, uh, Bruce brings back his sort of hammy style. There's a couple of bits sort of halfway through where it's quite funny how horrified he is. They're, they're seeing the look on it, like when the house is laughing at him, he just starts to laugh. And it is, it's horrifying. And you can see the madness in his eyes in, in that performance. But also it's actually quite funny to watch a house laughing at him. And the bit with that, <laughs> with his hand, I was... Yes crying watching that i actually re-watched a couple of bits uh during a break whilst at work and my colleague turned and looked at me and just said what the fuck are you doing because he couldn't <laughs> understand why i was laughing so hard and it was because i was watching the, the scene with the hand running around and, and when yeah. the, the hand gives him the finger 
It is so mm-hmm. simple. And you can even see where someone's hand is coming up through the, the floor and they've got all the bits to make it look like all the bone and arteries and what have you are sticking out the bottom. But it's still hilarious just to see this hand go and give you the finger. Even just the sound on the hand. Yes. You know, the, it doesn't have any vocal cords, but it can still make like a, a little muttery sound. And some, sometimes you can make out that like at one point, I swear to God, it turns around and says, fuck you. I swear to God, I heard. And maybe it's just me. I'm from Essex, so I swear at everything. But, but you know, yeah, I swear it's it was uh, it was cursing at him. It's a film that uh, obviously uh, bleeds into uh, into the times. Um, I, but I, I I just can't get my head around. We we can understand it now. You you make a comparison with Shaun of the Dead because it's a modern thing. Back in 1987, I don't think they'd really seen anything like this before. I can quite believe that. And, and for them to, to be so daring as to do that, where we talked about how Crime Wave was just crazy, chaotic, a cartoon on screen, and far too much to palette. Th- this d- tried to do something similar, but it, because it was it was a wee bit diluted, it was a bit more palatable, um, and also it was based around something that uh, a lot of people had affection for at the time. It actually it created the franchise. This is the one that I believe is fully responsible for everything that we have now that is Evil Dead based. Um, the the idea of the first film being there is, is fine and all, but it, it's a wee bit like maybe uh, Star Trek the motion picture. Whenever people think fondly of the Star Trek franchise, they think of some of the sequels. Mm. And this is the one that has... All of the iconic moments has the the chainsaw and the stump, the the sawed off uh, shotgun twiddled round the finger and and thrown into the holster. Things that you know, Army of Darkness made popular again to a larger audience because it it got that full cinematic release. It was even released in my wee town in in ninety two, <laughs> ninety three, what whatever year it was. Um, that brought that kind of uh, cool ass hero. To, to the forefront more so than it, than it had done in Evil Dead 2 and originally in, in Evil Dead. It's, it's quite a difficult film for me to actually go into uh, saying what my favourite thing would be about it. I do love that hand sequence and I think one of the most iconic moments in the film is the moment where he does cut off the hand and I thought that was the coolest thing mm. I'd ever seen when I was particularly young. First time I saw it I was like, wow, as he's He's uh, screaming as the blood is squirting across his face um, as he's cutting his own yeah. hand off with a, with a chainsaw. It was cool. And then the physical acting that Bruce is doing mm. as he, he uses his body as a prop, the whole idea of him lying there, his hand is pulling him across the floor. That's the bit I was going to mention. I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I just... I know clearly that's just him shoving himself along the ground, but to see it in the film... It it looks so real and it is so this idea that this your hand is going to kill you is it, it's it's <laughs> funny it really is funny yeah and um, it, it's something that I don't think any other actor could have ever passed no. off because his, his his physical uh, presence there is just uh, is, is is first rate absolutely first rate everything he does in that film even there's there's one moment toward the start of the film as as we cross from Evil Dead into Evil Dead 2 and the whole the, uh, he's been picked up by the evil and thrown through the forest mm. um, there's a moment where he sits up and the sun has come out and the moon has gone away and his eyes uncloud and he, he looks at his car and he thinks I'm going to get out of here and he just does one look to the left and his eyes go to the right, and his thumb or his tongue goes into his cheek, and it just says everything about everything that's just happened to him right now. I'm getting out of here. Yeah. And it, it just, that one look is so iconic to me. I, I love that 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 shot. It says so much without a single line of dialogue. He's gone, and then and and everything just ramps up from there. Um, it's it's, it's beautifully done. Now the special effects in this film are second to none. Um, the 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 ridiculous amount of blood as it pours through the wall, um, the the creature that's created toward the end, um, the moments that happen around that uh, are are somewhat distracting. I always felt 
that whilst the whole climax was happening and he's being sucked down a time hole to, um, well, as we find out in the medieval times, a stove yeah. <laughs> floats over his head uh, and is sucked down there more so than he is. He's, he's struggling his way across the floor, mm. so he's heavier than the stove. Um, and it, it's just that one gag is a reminder that you know you're not in reality here you're in a cartoon world where we're, we're portraying this um his hair turns gray yep. as he looks uh, at the the curiosity that's being created mm-hmm. in front of him um as fear strikes him it just brings together all these beautiful ridiculous stupid ideas but it gets away with it so well and it plays those so perfectly I quite like the childlike drawing of him in the Book of the Dead, mm, yes, holding his yeah. chainsaw arm in the air. Um, you haven't gotten to Army of Darkness. I have not, yet. not yet. Okay, so it'll be interesting to see mm-hmm. what what happens when we do, because obviously there is a sequel. I, I know, obviously, <laughs> I know of the sequel, and I know, I know what the, the essentially the, the what happens to him. I don't know the plot, but I didn't realise it was set up in this film. I wasn't expecting to see that until the next film. Uh, and one of my favourite shots, again, goes back to the car, is seeing that car crash land in medieval times. It kind mm. of made me think of um, Back to the Future Part 3, when Marty's driving the DeLorean across the plane and being chased by Indians, and just thinking, oh, yeah. what, what must those Indians be thinking? You know, those knights will see that and go, that's a weird-looking chariot. <laughs> I, I am, actually, now I think about it, well, no, it's it's uh, it's army of darkness where they're they're hitting it with the, their swords. <laughs> <laughs> what a piece of armor this! Is. <laughs> I look forward to that. Uh, the the two of them work just just perfectly together. The way the the original Evil Dead, you can I believe someone has done it at some stage where they've they've chopped off the start of Evil Dead Two and tacked it on to the end of the Evil Dead and then chopped off the end of Evil Dead Two and put Army of Darkness on. So that it's it's one big, I think it would be about three and a half hour epic, uh, as it follows Ash throughout his progression toward madness, and that's uh, yeah that's something we could have a chat about <laughs> is the, um, talking about the craziness that's happening in the house. He walks up to the mirror, and obviously in the first film he puts his hand in the mirror and it's water. Yes. This time around. Um, Ash comes out of the mirror and he reminds him that we just chopped up our girlfriend with a chainsaw. Mm-hmm. You start questioning yourself as to is is Bruce really incredibly insane and does he go up here and chop people up? You know that that is one thing that I I think what we were saying or, or what I'd mentioned about the opening where people say that he's too dumb. <laughs> that there was a an, an avenue they could have taken this in uh, where. Bruce is actually a serial killer and he does, he takes his girlfriends and his friends up to this cabin and chops them up and buries them in the woods because he is a madman. And I really liked that that moment where you're thinking, could that be the, yeah. the secret behind the Evil Dead? And it wasn't until I watched it this this recent time that I started thinking, oh, that's that's something that could be a thing. Um, they could have taken it in a very different way. Obviously, they wouldn't have got as much mileage out of it as uh, as they did no. with the the direction they did take it with, or take it in. But uh, yeah, the the film did really well. It went on to be a a cult classic, um, and there there was a joke for many years that any time Anchor Bay needed to pay the rent, all they did was put out a new version of Evil Dead Two on DVD. <sighs> and I I would say that it's probably. Not far from the it's, truth? No, I'd, I'd like to think that this film is the most released film on DVD. It's got to be. There's got to be some kind of rankings um, for the amount of time something has come out on physical media because this film never stopped coming out. I have uh, about six different versions of it because every time they release it, they'll throw on an extra audio commentary or a new documentary or... In, in some cases, uh, Bruce has created, there was one in particular called Phanalysis, which is a little documentary he made, and that was released on one of the DVDs as well. So, you know, you, you ended up having to buy multiple <laughs> copies of it in order to get a complete picture of everything that was going on. And like the original Evil Dead, there isn't 
a single frame of this film that hasn't been talked about over and over again by everyone who was involved in it. And I, I love that. If, if you get into this film, you can find everything out about this. The recipe that they used for making the fake blood, <laughs> uh, the sounds that they used for uh, bones cracking, for trees lashing you, um, all these things. And that's... It's it's a whole it's a wormhole itself, much like at the end of the film, for you to get into, if you want to find out more. And I'd say this is one of the most documented films available today as well. And anyone who's looking to make something uh, would would do well to watch this and the original Evil Dead's special features because they talk about so many interesting things. Sam created techniques on this film to be able to do steady cam and it's, he had the opposite of steady cam which was shaky cam yeah. as well which is something that he put together and you know that 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 just shows how innovative this film actually was it all, like like you said it was it wouldn't exist without the evil dead but it has yeah. surpassed the evil dead the like you say crime wave is an over the top slapstick comedy it really took you on a roller coaster ride whereas here they have found the the perfect mix of action, horror, and comedy, and it doesn't feel disjointed from the original Evil Dead. It it fits. It feels like a continuation of that story, mm -hmm. and it flows rather than feeling like you know handbrake turn, new direction, new new movie, and we're gonna change the way the franchise goes. It just flows. It does. There's never really a dull moment. I suppose whenever it's introducing the newer characters uh, who are coming to the cabin, you know, that gives you a bit of a breather. But what they're talking about is is interesting enough to develop the universe. Um, the supporting cast, take for example the late Dan Hicks, who uh, becomes a bit of a, a Sam Raimi um, go-to guy because he's in... He's in a number of the Spider-Man movies, I think. Uh, or maybe he's just in Spider-Man 2, now that I'm looking mm -hmm. at it. But he's in Dark Man and Easy Wheels and Intruder as well. My name is Bruce. Uh, he was someone that they continually used. Sarah Barry as well, who plays Dr. Raymond Noby, uh, his, his daughter uh, in the film. She didn't really go on to too much more other than this and uh, she does appear uh, in a number of things uh, thanks to her notoriety in Evil Dead 2 but it was uh, it was Ted Raimi who plays Noby's wife Henrietta and she's the thing in the cellar <laughs> you, if you watch any of the making of documentaries about it that uh, he was put through hell in this film I bet he was. maybe because he was a wee bit too young to be put through hell in the original <laughs> Evil Dead um, and because he was Sam's brother, Sam felt that he could do whatever he wanted to his brother, um, as brothers do. Yep. This was the film that got Ted into the Screen Actors Guild. And after that, um, he, he started making films. And he, he has a, a wide body, a, a large career. Not a wide body. He does in the Henrietta suit. He's particularly wide. <laughs> yeah, but, um, that was quite a suit. She's <laughs> flying yeah. around the room. That was quite a sight to see. And the, there's a, a beautiful story about how uh, I think Bruce was underneath him. And there was a... You can actually see in the film there's liquid pouring out of the suit. And that is just Ted's sweat. Ugh. Yeah, that's uh, particularly gnarly. But... Um, yeah, it, it makes for just that more of a, an endearing story where you, you getting to know what happened in the background makes for a, a more intense story mm -hmm. as well, yeah. So, yeah, Evil Dead 2 was a, a massive hit for the guys and uh, it went on to obviously create the sequel, Army of Darkness. And uh, whilst the, the games were uh, of the franchise, they were mostly inspired by this film. And there was a couple of games that came out uh, on the PlayStation and Windows and things like that, and iPads and Android ones. We we will discuss them uh, as we as we go along in the years that they they came out. So uh, so look forward to those if you're looking for a bit of gaming action when it comes to Evil Dead. We will have you covered there. But Bruce didn't just do that one thing this year. No, he was off uh, using his uh, Screen Actors Guild membership and appearing in something else as well. Now, we have several tapes to show. Do you have video equipment? And Simon, you, you watched this, didn't you? I did. <laughs> he was in a, an episode of Knott's Landing, 
which obviously was a big thing for him at the time, I'm sure, getting into a soap opera like this, would be any young aspiring actor's dream. Um, and he plays uh, Michael York's right-hand man, I suppose, uh, in one episode of Knott's Landing, uh, a character who they fleshed out so much for the 30 seconds yeah. that he's on screen by giving him both the first and last name, Joel Benson. I don't even think they use his name in the TV series. Not that I remember, no. No, he's not audibly introduced or anything like that. It's just uh, IMDB happens to list him as Joel Benson, so we know him as Joel Benson, and he introduces one character to Michael York's character. Now, I don't particularly know Knott's Landing. Um, I know it's a spin-off of Dallas, and that's about it. My mother liked Dallas. I don't think she watched Knott's Landing because it was just a bit too much, and there was Falcon's Crest was another one as well, wasn't it? And <laughs> Or maybe that was Dynasty. I, I don't know. Uh, but these were big American soap operas that were um, that were really employing a lot of the actors out there. And um, Bruce managed to get his nose in. What did you think of his role in Knott's Landing, 1990, or 1987, Season 9, Episode 7, Episode Say Uncle? Uh, well, he was probably the most likable character in the entire episode. Of course, I, I've never seen an episode of this show. I've heard of it. I knew nothing about it. I had no idea it was tied to Dallas, another show I've never seen an episode of. In fact, the only thing I know about Dallas is is the famous uh, twist they put in to return a, uh, a character who died. And I only know about that because I saw the parody in the episode of Family Guy where the end of the world yeah. happens. And he uh, she opens the shower and there he is. And he's like, what's Family Guy? Um Bobby, you yeah. yeah. But go, going back to this, I had no idea what the show was about, or I knew it was a soap opera. Um, I had no idea what Bruce's role was in it, so I thought I'll just watch the episode. And I had a hunch he was going to be in it for 30 seconds right at the end, but I thought, no, I will watch it all the way through. Generally had no clue what was going on. In fact, the most shocking thing I found was that William Devane was in it, uh, an actor I particularly like after having seen him in films like uh, Space Cowboys, uh, the show 24, which I was a big fan of, but also the show Pay uh, the movie Payback, mm. uh, the Mel Gibson film. I love that film. I love the director's cut. I love the theatrical cut of that film. Two very different films, even though they're the same film, but I love both versions. He is brilliant, and he's one of the best things in that film. So to see him in this yeah. soap opera, uh, I believe he was with his daughter and wife had run off or something or other, and he was going through babysitters. I don't know. Um, to see him in this was shocking. Uh, the rest of it, I have no idea. It's the usual soap opera drama of meddling grandmothers and all that shit uh, and some drowning girl somewhere. Um, uh, and then finally gets to it, and they are talking about a meeting and this person who's a assistant to big boss investor person man and it's like oh there he is and i looked at the time and thought there's three minutes left in the episode and as you say he's in it for about 30 seconds he says yes great meeting walk outside here's my boss points at a limo and you never see him again end episode still the most likable person in that film <laughs> in that show <laughs> because everyone else was awful and despicable and typically 80s they, they have big shoulder pads and uh, awful haircuts and but we still love the 80s i mean stranger things is a perfect i love stranger things perfect example i love 80s movies there's so many that are great but <laughs> the fashions were questionable they, they were yeah and especially this is out in california or somewhere like that yep. during the 80s uh this this sequence and the Rolls Royces and things like that. oh it was permed hair was it was that was, that, was, that it was one of the things it was uh, Joan Van Ark who got me because she kind of had a mullet type long hair thing I, I that uh, looked like it took about three cans of hairspray to achieve and yeah. it's like uh, oh you're denying liking this other person who's just as easily despicable as you are but <laughs> even so we. You're basically going to avoid him all episode, and by the end of the episode, oh, lo and behold, there she is. She's interested in him again. And no doubt, I'm sure if I watched any more episodes, her other husband, boyfriend, whatever, the person who thinks he is the father of her children, will show up and go, oh, what's going on? And she'll be all confused, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
It's a it's a trashy show. Um, I I do know about it because of my well, my mother did watch Dallas, and I used to watch it with her when I was quite young, um, and Dynasty as well. Uh, so I I've done my tour of duty in American Soapville. I don't have to do Knots Landing as well, but it must have been popular enough that it got to season nine. Yeah, I'm sure it was. I, I don't even know. How, I'll have a quick look and see how many seasons there were. Um, perhaps it was around this time that Bruce was going. I'm I'm sick of this studio thing, and I'm wanting to bail. Um, but I do believe reading his biography. I should have researched this before I came on there. But I oh, did 14 seasons actually, not slanting. Uh, it's a lot of a lot of crap. Um, Bruce met his first wife on a soap opera. Um, she was a soap opera actress. Um, and it might have been this one. I I can't quite remember. So if any if anything came from this, it's that that Bruce kind of developed his personal life uh, out of out of Knots Landing. But it wouldn't be until the next year that he he got another particularly cracking lead role in a in a feature film. And uh, I guess that's a that's a fairly good segue for us to roll up this podcast and and move over to the next one because in the next episode we're going to 1988 where Bruce goes up against a maniac cop and and makes a noise in another film (laughs) so if you want to get in touch with us you can by emailing me at gareth at a year in the career dot com and Simon as well at Simon at a year in the career dot com excellent and um, unless you have anything else you want to add we could roll it up and go I think I'm done groovy so take care everyone and we'll speak to you soon see you next time